Welcome back to season three of Snubs and Dubs. We've been talking about the Snubs and Dubs of the 74th Academy Award for Best Picture. I'm your host, Kyle Tobiasen, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Miller. Jason, how's it going? How you doing? In a word, groovy. <laughs> it's going well. How about you, Kyle? That's good. I'm good. I'm off for the Christmas break now, and it kind of is starting to look a lot like Christmas. Outside. Oh, yeah. The snow is falling in big, flaky chunks, which is classic Christmas love fashion sort of thing, but... It's also gross, but I don't have yep. to go outside. So there you go. <laughs> I got four more work days, but we had our Christmas party today. Uh, so the mental checking out has already occurred. Like, yeah. I don't know why they bother. They're going to pay <laughs> me my normal rate to work at most <laughs> half. <laughs> they should yeah. have just given us this extra time off, but that's on them. So I'm yeah. not going to complain. No, but now it's weird to be off. I don't know if I have enough things to do. I've made a list of things that I want to do. Checking it twice? I, I will check it twice. Actually, it includes some gift shopping, so I should oh. t- definitely check that twice. You probably should. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, try, try to be productive. Can't I mean, you don't even lazy. need to be. It's the Christmas. It's That's true. not it's for true. productivity. Turn that part of your <laughs> monkey brain off. You can just sit on a couch from now till January 2nd if you choose to. And there's nothing it's wrong true. with that. I guess so. I'm already going to judge you anyway. You can do whatever you want. It's not going to matter. Uh, well, I will be doing some movie watching but i also did some movie watching did you do any movie watching in the last little bit i did a little movie watching oh, yeah? in the last little bit i believe you've heard of emily in perry uh like the the tv show yes okay yeah but I've have it, you yeah. heard of emily the crimmy i have no. also heard of emily the criminal <laughs> i haven't seen this one but i've been interested because i like aubrey plaza and i i heard it was good so what did you think of it it's all right yeah it's not bad no it's a little flat because in my opinion, Aubrey Plaza's character as the main character yeah. isn't fantastic because oh, okay. she's still Aubrey Plaza. Like, you know what to expect. <laughs> right. She's, you know, sarcastic, biting. She does come out. A, she, she's a little more character than in like Parks and Rec, but right. like it's similar. And I don't, in my opinion, think it was enough to really drive a movie, oh, okay. especially because her love interest in this as well also wasn't really a lot of character and Mm. their relationship didn't make a lot of immediate sense when it started right so i felt like that as a driving force was kind of weak it also had a bizarre message that like it did touch (laughs) on what i think were accurate like we were good criticisms of the world at large you know unpaid internships or crap Mm. not allowing someone to work because they have a criminal past Mm. that's kind of whack but the answer is rob people. <laughs> and the moral question of is that good is answered with yes. Okay. <laughs> it works out quite well. So it's hmm. it's interesting. It's not a must watch. Okay. You know, like I mean, over the Christmas break, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna have enough time to watch this. Yeah. If you're not gonna be wrong for watching it, yeah. but like don't run off to go watch okay. Emily the Crimmy. No. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Kyle? What you've been watching? I saw two new movies. The first I saw was Bones and All. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if have you heard of this at all? No. It's a movie with Timothy Chalamet and I forget the other actress who's the lead, but it's essentially a love story about cannibals. Interesting. Um, it, it was very interesting, also very gross and pretty horrifying at parts. Like it is like a hard R movie. Like there is like a lot of graphic content and like people just like ripping flesh off of other people in like gross visceral manners. But then you're also expected to like kind of get behind these two characters odd romance. Mm. And so I don't know if I could say I really liked it. It was just like it was well made. And there was a lot of great acting in it, especially Mark Rylance is in it for this for a little bit. He just pops up kind of twice and he plays the creepiest fucking guy that you will ever see on screen. But he was just chewing scenery. It was so entertaining to watch, but it also made you so uncomfortable because he's just this weird gross cannibal person that says he can like smell other cannibals from like down the block. And that's why he tracked down this one girl. Anyways, it was like fine. I don't know. It's just like, it's hard to recommend it because it's so nasty. Oh, you look like a monster. If you recommend this to the wrong (laughs) person, that is going to paint you as a human being. after that. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. It was weird. I mean, I'm glad I saw it in a sense, but also I'm like horrified with some of the things that were in it. So like, it was just kind of, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Yeah. I'm I'm super mixed. You know, it's probably good that you thought it was weird. I think that does reflect well on your character. Yeah. The other movie I saw was not so weird. It was avatar the way of water long time coming. 
long time playing <laughs> as well. Yes. That's a long goddamn movie. Uh, yeah, it was a long movie. And fucking hell, I have to complain about this again because I've been complaining about this to everybody I know. But the pre-show is getting longer and longer. Mm-hmm. Literally every time I've seen a movie now, it was went from like 10 minutes to 15 Last night it was 25 minutes. Oh my god. Before the movie started and our movie's scheduled start time was 8:20. This is a 3 hour plus movie. It's like 3 and change. Yeah. It's not even like a tight 3. It is like 3 and then some. Yeah, exactly. And so when you're pushing that runtime an additional 25 minutes to our start time being at 8:45 rather than 8:20, we're getting out there just before midnight. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's fucked. Like, there was, like, cool previews for Mission Impossible, Creed 3, and Oppenheimer, which were exclusive to this. But, like, they didn't need the other trailers or commercials that were in there. Yeah, because how much is commercials? You're paying money to be in there to see commercials. That's garbage. It is stupid. But, uh, anyways, uh, those issues aside, I really liked Avatar 2. I'm so Uh, glad. I'm so excited to go. It was, like... I will say if you liked the first one, you will probably like this one. But if you also had issues with the first one, you might also have issues with this one because it has the same type of problems Mm. where story is very thin and the characters are kind of one note in a lot of ways. But visually, it is incredible. Like it is so beautiful to look at. And I don't know how the special effects artists managed to do this stuff and what James Cameron put into it in terms of the technology to be created to make this movie is incredible. And I give them huge props because what they pulled off was like a visual masterpiece and the story being as bare bones as it was did work for the movie. And I think it doesn't need to be as elaborate as maybe some people want from it Yeah, because at the end of the day, this is a three hour epic blockbuster type movie you don't need to think too hard about it. Mm -hmm. Like what you want to think about is like what you're seeing on screen and having the visuals kind of wow you. And if the story is competent enough to encourage you to go through the entire movie and feel compelled to continue, then I think that's fine. Yeah. If you need more than that, you might leave this with something to be desired. I left with a little bit of like want for to see more Jake and Natiri because they are a little bit sidelined in this movie in favor of their children, which, you know, it's like, I guess it's kind of a passing of the torch and you kind of do need to have these new characters mm-hmm. to sort of continue this story. And I think you do need to acknowledge how long it's been since the first Avatar. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good. I would recommend it. I'm going again on Tuesday. Oh, so I'm, I'm going to get another experience and I'm really excited because it's it's fun to watch. I mean, when I went to the first Avatar, I thought, man, this is a very middling movie with incredibly cool graphics that yeah. I loved. I don't know if I care that much for this series. And yeah. then as soon as Avatar 2 is released, I'm now defending that movie with my life. <laughs> and I want to get there as soon as I can. And yeah. I don't really know why. Yeah. I will say I didn't see it in the high frame rate. I know that a lot of screens like AVX are showing it at I think it's 48 frames per second. And I the common complaint I'm seeing from that is it starts to look more like a video game than a movie. Mm-hmm. The IMAX showing that I had did not have high frame rate. It was just IMAX 3D. But if we were to see it in AVX, it would have that high frame rate. So I am kind of curious to see the difference. Yeah. But I, I'm seeing it again in IMAX, which I think is the ideal format to see it in, especially because that 48 frames per second could be distracting for some people. Mm-hmm. I didn't notice like any video game type look, but I've heard that complaint. So mm-hmm. if you see it in an AVX and you see when you're booking your tickets, the HFR, it, you might notice looking a little bit strange because of the high frame rate, but I guess that's how they wanted it to be yeah. seen. I don't know. I don't know. Just get better video cards, you scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> get a better build. What can I tell you? Yeah. Well, it's because it's like it's adding so many frames to the picture that it reduces motion blur and it starts looking like because most video games now just play in like 30 to 60 frames per second. Yeah. And that's like ideal for video games because you want to get those extra frames, but that like smooths everything over. And when you add 48 frames per second to a movie, it starts to smooth everything over. Mm -hmm. And so because of our association visually with 60 frames to video games and high frame rate to video games, then it would have high frame rate in movies. It starts to look weird because it's not what we're used to. Interesting. So yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was all I watched other than this episode's movie. Of course, season three of Snubs and Dubs is covering the films from the year 2001. And so for episode 20, we are talking about the last Best Picture nominee for this season before the winner, Moulin Rouge. Had you seen it before? No, but I recognize the title. If someone said, hey, do you know what Moulin Rouge is to me? I'd say, no, 
but I recognize the title, <laughs> and that's about my familiarity with it. How about you, Kyle? Oh, boy. Um, so if people didn't get from my introduction to it at the end of last episode, I thought that this movie was a big pile of shit because mm-hmm. the last time I tried to watch this movie, which was the first time I tried to watch this movie, was I think a year or two years ago. I had bought the Blu-ray copy because I just, I'm just i trying to collect all the Best Picture nominees, and that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I put it in, and I stopped 35 minutes in. 35 minutes in? 35 minutes exactly, because when I put the disc back in, it told me, hey, do you want to resume your playtime? And I was like, okay, let's see where I stopped. And so I, <laughs> I stopped at 35 minutes in. And so now, and then I went back to the start and watched it over again. This is one of the first movies I put on that I could not finish, that really? I had to stop because mm-hmm. it was just giving me such a bad feeling. I just couldn't finish it. I just was like, I have better things to do yeah. with my time than continue with this. What scene was that? Was that the love song scene between Christian Yes, and oh, it is okay. the first time that they are in a room together, and it's the, when he's singing uh, the Elton John cover. Mm. Um, yeah, I stopped after that. Cool. <laughs> but, anyways, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's been like I think a year or so since that, and I didn't think I was going to return to it before we decided to do this season, mostly because of Lord of the Rings. But now we had to take this along. So, <laughs> yeah. But if you're interested in Moulin Rouge, I've included the links to the physical media related to it in the show notes. If you buy through that link, it'll help out our show. Or if you have any other Amazon shopping to do, follow the general link to help out our show in the process. Reminded that this is going to be a spoiler filled conversation. So if you haven't seen Moulin Rouge yet and you want to, go ahead and do so. I've also included time codes in the show notes so you can skip around to your heart's desire. But without further ado, let's get into it. Moulin Rouge is a 2001 jukebox musical romantic drama film directed and co-produced by Baz Luhrmann. It was written by Baz Luhrmann and Craig Pierce. Moulin Rouge stars Nicole Kidman as Satine, Ewan McGregor as Christian, John Leguizamo as Henry D. I'm not going to say that last name. Jim Broadbent as Harold Zidler and Richard Roxburgh as the Duke of Monroth. It has a runtime of 128 minutes. And after premiering at the Cannes Film Festival on May 9th, it went wide just over a week later on May 18th, 2001. It was actually chosen to be the opening film of the entire Cannes Film Festival, probably because everything afterwards, by comparison, would look good. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But Jason, what did you think of Moulin Rouge? No, Kyle, you go first. Upon (laughs) rewatch, what did you think of Moulin Rouge? Okay, well, let me press this. Let me start by saying I still don't like it. Okay. But after getting past the threshold of where I was before, the rest of the movie isn't as exhausting to watch. It is a little bit easier to sit through. And I did find that I was able to find pieces that I enjoyed within the movie in the second and third act. But that first act is so hard to get through that like it was almost headache inducing. It was like nauseating. Like I was like, I had a really hard time, but I, I didn't hate it as much. Mm-hmm. And so I like if I were to introduce some of this movie again, I would probably wouldn't say it's a big pile of shit. I just would say I don't really care for it. Mm-hmm. But anyways, what did you think now? It's fun. Fuck. It's good. <laughs> What's your problem? I kept watching this movie. Yeah. I was I kept waiting to see what you hated. It's good. <laughs> I will say, I get what you mean. I was yeah. a little scared at first when they had thir- like you were talking about how, you know, Avatar is 48 frames per second. Mm-hmm. This is 48 cuts per second yeah. in, the first, <laughs> yes. in the start of this movie. And I was a little scared that my stomach wouldn't hold. But by the time they get to the Moulin Rouge for the first time, mm-hmm. I was in. It's yeah. fun. Everyone's having a great time. Mm. Everyone's smiling. Mm. Everyone's dancing. Mm. We have some fun music. Mm. There's some beautiful vocal performances in this. They have a good time with the music. They're doing their own thing. We got cover to cover covers. It's a great time. I don't know what your problem is. I also don't think I like the covers. I feel like my expectation of a musical... This is like obviously my personal view. And so, I mean, this podcast is all about subjective yeah. opinion anyway. So anyways, I didn't know this was a covers musical. Like I thought this was like having its own original music. And I love musicals. Like, mm-hmm. and I love discovering new original musical music. But when it was covers, especially weird ones, like, I don't know. What, what was in this movie in terms of their music? Other than, um, tiny, what was it? Was it tiny? No. Uh, tiny, was it Tiny Dancer? I don't think so. 
Yeah, that's wait, Maybe? no, no, that's no. no, no. What is what's the fucking word? Uh, your song. It's your yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, I had to go through Elsa John there for it's a your second. song, Tiny your Dancer. Song. And then like that whole opening sequence had like a was it voulez vu? Um, yeah, and there was like like a virgin in there. Oh, that, but the like a virgin was it. fun, Kyle. Yeah. Open your heart a little. I bit. I just don't think I liked the covers. Oh, and also, I might get hate for this, but I don't necessarily think Uma McGregor is a great singer. What? I don't think he's that good. Are you sure you finished the movie? I'm the pretty second time? <laughs> I just didn't find that I liked his versions of the songs more than the original performers. Which is like, that's like, my perception because I like the original songs. And so when you're putting it in this and I already don't like the movie and the vocal performance isn't as strong as maybe I was hoping. It, it, it kind of accumulated into a feeling of like, well, I don't like this. And what I would never listen to this from first. Ewan McGregor? <laughs> he was gorgeous in this. His voice is beautiful. He's a canary. Okay, okay. What did you want? Okay. All right. I mean, he was great performance wise. Yeah, which especially is, with the scene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is not as much as I could say for Nicole Kidman, who I know this was a choice. Like this was the director's choice. Yeah. I fucking hated everything that she was doing. Yeah. She was over the top to a degree that I could not stand her. Like, especially, and this is probably why I ended it, but like when he's doing the poetry reading to her. And like, or like he's trying to read her poetry and she thinks that he's the Duke and he's, we should get to the plot later. But like after that scene, I was like, she's too much. Like mm-hmm. this, she's doing too much and I can't stand it. Like okay. I couldn't sit there and stand it. Initially what I thought was happening was she knew that Ewan McGregor wasn't going to sleep with her. So then she starts making those noises to make her boss think that everything's going well. Maybe. But then it turns out Ziggler's <laughs> too far away to hear. So that was, I was, um, after that, I was actually kind of confused. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get into the plot. Yeah. Spoiler free reactions, though. I hated it. So Jason likes it. I like it's fun. All right. Okay, fine. Uh, well, Jason's going to read straight through the plot. If you don't need the refresher, you don't want to know, you can skip right to the discussion by following the time codes in the show notes. But here's Moulin Rouge. In 1900 in Paris, Christian, a young writer depressed about the recent death of the woman he loved, begins writing their story on his typewriter. A year earlier, he arrives in the Montmartre. You know what? Last time we had a French episode. It was (laughs) Emily. I tried really hard. I'm phoning this one in. A year earlier, he arrives in Montmartre, district of Paris. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking awesome. To join the Bohemian movement, he suddenly meets... Henry de Toulouse Latry and his troupe of performers who are writing a play called Spectacular Spectacular. After Christian helps them complete the play, they go to the Moulin Rouge, where they hope Christian's talents will impress Satine, the star performer, and courtesan, who will in turn convince Harold Zidler, the proprietor of the Moulin Rouge, to let Christian write the show. However, Zidler plans to have the wealthy, powerful, and unscrupulous Duke of Monroth sleep with Satine in exchange for potential financing to convert the club into a theater. That night, Satine mistakes Christian for the Duke and attempts to seduce him by dancing with him before retiring to her private chamber with him to discuss things privately. But eventually, Christian reveals his true identity. After the Duke interrupts them, Satine claims that the two of them and the Bohemians were rehearsing Spectacular Spectacular. Aided by Zidler, Christian and the Bohemians improvise a story for the Duke about a beautiful Indian courtesan who falls in love with the poor sitar player she mistook for the evil Maharaja. Proving the story, the Duke agrees to invest, but only if Satine and the Moulin Rouge are turned over to him. Later, Satine claims not to be in love with Christian, but he eventually wears down her resolve and they kiss. During construction at the Moulin Rouge, Christian and Satine's love deepens while the Duke becomes frustrated with all the time he thinks Satine is spending with Christian working on the play. To calm him, Zidler arranges for Satine to spend the night with the Duke and angrily tells her to end their affair. She misses the dinner when she falls unconscious, leading to a doctor to diagnose a fatal case of consumption. She does try to end things by telling Christian that their relationship is endangering the production, but Christian writes a secret song to include in the show that affirms their unending passionate love. At the final rehearsal, Nini, a can-can dancer jealous of Satine's popularity, hints to the Duke that the play represents the relationship between him, Christian, and Satine. Enraged, the Duke demands that the show ends with the courtesan marrying the Maharaja instead of Christian's ending where she marries the sitar player. Satine promises to spend the night with him, after which they will decide on the ending. Ultimately, she fails to seduce the Duke due to her feelings for Christian, and Le Chocolat, that was risque as a name. <laughs> I was kind of dumbfounded by that one. One of the cabaret dancers saves her from the Duke's attempt to rape her. Christian decides that he and Satine should leave the show behind and run away to be together while the Duke vows to kill Christian. Zidler finds Satine in her dressing room packing. He tells her that her illness is fatal and that the Duke is planning on murdering Christian and that if she wants Christian to live, she will cut him off completely and be with the Duke. Mustering all of her acting abilities, she complies, leaving Christian devastated. 
On the opening night of the show, in front of a full audience, Christian denounces Satine and vows to give her to the Duke before walking off the stage. But Toulouse Latree cries out from the rafters, The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return! This spurs Satine to sing their secret song, causing Christian to change his mind. After Zidler and the company thwart several attempts by the Duke and his bodyguard to kill Christian, the show ends with Christian and Satine proclaiming their love as the Duke permanently storms out of the cabaret. The audience erupts in applause, but Satine collapses after the curtains close. Before dying, she tells Christian to write their story so she'll always be with him. In the present, the Moulin Rouge is in despair. The Duke and the Bohemians are gone, and Christian finishes his and Satine's love story, declaring their love will live forever. What a sweet ending. Aw, how could you hate that? I couldn't imagine living in a world where I hated love. Kyle, how does it feel? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I must hate love, but you know what I hate more? What? How they fucking used John Leguizamo in this movie. I, he's also an annoying character. I don't like him at all. And I love John Leguizamo, but they uh, made me not like John Leguizamo. I just, I hated his character. I Awful. Can't, can't. Gross. Now, me, being someone who can enjoy things that has fun, <laughs> I didn't think he was that bad. Like, he was completely overwrought as a character, but, yeah. like, taken to an extreme that it was funny. Yeah. I thought he was fun. Okay. okay, there's, like, all of, a lot of these characters, except for maybe Ewan McGregor's character, Christian, are, like, super over the top. Way over the which top. Which is, like, it is a choice, and it can work, and I found it really worked with the Duke, because mm -hmm. the actor that plays the Duke, I have his name here. Richard Roxburgh, he was chewing scenery. Oh, that guy was munching. fucking like salivating and spitting in places. Yeah. Like I really liked his performance, especially near the end when like he was like, you could tell he was getting so viscerally upset by how like Satine and Christian were like having this affair behind him and how things were kind of slipping out of his grasp and how all of this was going on behind his back. And like, just like him, like trying to command respect while being so desperate at the same time too and being like probably such a fragile man mm -hmm. it was like that like really worked for me but I feel like that as like a villain performance works because I think villains can chew that type of scenery yeah. and go so over the top and be corny that it works whereas like when all of your characters are so over the top it starts to kind of be annoying that's how I found it. What I found was I think Nicole Kidman had the hardest job of all because Ewan McGregor is Christian. He's grounded. He's yeah. a real human being. So he actually has like a role that you can figure out. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is bad shit, crazy, bounce off the walls, insanity. And then Nicole Kidman's a teen has to be the bridge between the two. Yeah, that's really hard to do. And I don't think a fantastic job was done either by her or the writing. I don't mm. know where the fault lies. I think the challenge was that is incredibly hard to bridge between the two worlds and her character just, just doesn't quite do it. Yeah, and that's where I really struggled too because I didn't really care too, too much about these characters. And I mean, like their romance is sweet mm -hmm. and like it is kind of like a classic will they, won't they, like how would things work out? Romeo and Juliet type shit, which is hilarious because Boz Lerman also did a Romeo and Juliet that I really hated. So <laughs> I feel like I just don't like Boz Lerman's style. I haven't seen Elvis yet and I I, I haven't feel heard like I of should. the greatest praise. Well, it's got like, it's got a positive Rotten Tomatoes score. And so I think it's got some praise, but like also it's got Boz Lerman praise, which yeah. I feel like is like the same type where like you either love him or hate him. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the side where I really don't like it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's just too much. It's too visually overstimulating. But anyways, yeah, the romance is kind of Romeo and Juliet in a sense, because I mean, it's, at the end she does die and he's like saddened by that. But I mean, he doesn't also kill himself. No, he so he really took his... the wuss way out. Yeah. Like, if you really <laughs> yeah. love someone, kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm mean, like in a sense, like the romance arc is kind of you know it's always been done before like as a mm -hmm. lot of these romantic arcs that have but it was effective enough that i was like able to kind of like follow it and be kind of get behind their romance especially when the duke was so awful because you don't want her to be with him yeah but i just i don't know i just couldn't necessarily get behind all these characters i will say like as I said at the start, like the second half of this movie is a lot more calm down. I think like, they figure it out. Yeah. They get their mix right in the second act. And that made it a lot easier to watch. It was almost like I, I, I think I noticed it more because I suffered through that first 35 minutes the first time and couldn't finish. So that when I did finish, I pushed through mm -hmm. and like I saw what was on the other side of that. It was kind of like, oh, like this is actually kind of. A relief yeah. like it is almost like a you actually can come up for air for a second when it starts to calm down a little bit and that's when i found that i was starting to kind of find my enjoyment in the movie mm -hmm. one scene in particular i really liked 
was the Roxanne scene. Oh, with yeah. The, oh, uh, yeah. That was probably my favorite number, and it doesn't have really anything to do. I mean, it's kind of interspersed with Ewan McGregor singing, but like it's with just the prostitute and the fainting man. Mm-hmm. And like that whole scene, like visually, performance wise, like vocally performance and their um, the dance choreography that they had for it. Oh, it's so it was raw. really effective. I it's really so like that. Raw. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple numbers that I think are really cool. And what I, my personal enjoyment, I love that this is about covers. Yeah. I think that's so fun. I think it's a fresh take on things that you can have, like, even though they are covers, they're so unlike the originals that there's a lot of writing that went into this. And there's so many covers that overlap other covers mm. to make like a deep layer of song and sound and yeah. storytelling that I thought was really well pulled off. Like that scene where they're singing Roxanne over whatever stupid song Christian has going on. That's not <laughs> as good as their cover yeah. of Roxanne. It still adds a lot of depth to it. Mm. Or when they're first at the Moulin Rouge where they have like, um, I don't know what the songs are called, but they have like four or five songs yeah. that loop into each other, lace over each other. And I thought yeah. that was an amazing, amazing scene like that really tied me over from the first bit of it where they have more cuts in a minute than there are seconds yeah which i don't understand both that decision and how much they strayed from that by the end Mm. it's really just the first 30 minutes that have like a nauseating pace yeah and i wish they went back and just matched the tone to the rest of the movie and it would have been way more effective i don't understand why they did that to start with yeah i feel like it put me off at the start and like I got off on a wrong foot and obviously because I, it was like the first movie ever I really couldn't finish it all had that sort of effect where like I was already ready to go and not liking it so much mm-hmm. and then when like the first 35 minutes are still like that's not that, like they would change by the time <laughs> I went to watch it again but maybe you've but, like, changed yeah maybe I've changed but when they when they still gave me that effect it really makes you wonder what would have my enjoyment been like if the first 30 minutes weren't so aggressive in terms of like it's editing and it's flashiness and this style. Like I know they probably wanted to get all of that tone out and like basically show on like the biggest scale that they could, like this is what this movie is. Yeah. If you're not on board, then you'll probably leave after 35 minutes. But if you are on board, you know, maybe we'll take you through and you'll have a nice time, Mm -hmm. which that seemed to be the experience you had. But like it's, you know, I still find that that was, it's just too much. And Mm -hmm. I think it just, Could have done with a little bit of calming down. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot, but I was in the mood for a lot when I watched this. And that first scene in the Moulin Rouge really (laughs) got me there. Like the choreography in this is fantastic in so Mm -hmm. many different parts. The amount of dancers that they have and everything that's going on and the way that plays, like the motion plays with the color and the songs is just so vivid to me. And I really got sucked into whenever like there was a musical number going on. Yeah. I felt so captured by it that it got me through some of the weaker other parts that like i mean story wise it's fun that it's like a play within a play kind of thing where they're Mm. telegraphing the spectacular spectacular they're writing is the movie you're watching Mm -hmm. essentially and i think that is a fun element to it It almost shakespearean in a way but like a very very modern not at all shakespeare kind of shakespeare (laughs) and i thought that was really interesting like something about this movie really got me that's fair i will say like the other parts that i really liked that i will never dock it for is its choreography, production design, and costume design. Yeah. Those elements of this are so well done. Like, it is very vivid. The costumes are amazing. And there's so many people in costumes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were handling, I don't know if some of it was CGI, but it all looked like there was a lot of extras there. But so many people dancing and choreographed within each other. And, like, these huge, large set pieces of dance and music and all of them have these elaborate costumes that have colors that really pop and all of them are like moving in a way that kind of flows together and makes the scene come alive a lot more like those elements really work I just find that I wish I could stop for a second and look at all of them. Oh, yeah. You do not have that option. That is not available to you. You take it in all at once and for one second. Yeah. And I found that some of the additional sound design was comical like yeah. i know like again it's an over-the-top movie but they literally have like clown car sounds like yeah. the and then bonk like <laughs> stuff like that like throughout it's great I, <laughs> it's so I fun guess, i guess but like, you're at the circus this movie is the circus it's true it, it is this yeah that's a great analogy this movie is definitely a circus and i i do think you do have to be in the mood for it yeah and i feel like maybe the first time i really wasn't <laughs> uh because i was like oh i'll sit down for a classic oscar musical drama 
Let's go. Yeah. And it was nope. this. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I don't but know. Even the, like, I will say, I was in the mood for this once it got rolling. Yeah. And I still found the first 30 minutes kind of hard. Yeah. That's, that's right. how insane the editing yeah. in this was. Mm. Yep. Good. Well, do you want to hear what other people thought? Yeah, let's hear what other sure. people thought. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a critic score of 75%. And an audience score of 89%. So I'm a little surprised at that 89. I kind of thought that critic score would be where the audiences were at too. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Because I think critics at 75, like that's fair. Yeah. I think that like this movie, obviously within the two of us can be very divisive. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm actually also surprised that the audience score is quite high. Uh, IMDb 7.6 and Metacritic 66. So yeah, yeah a little bit kind of all over the place within the like 65 to 89. But, <laughs> but like, I think you, you can find a lot to enjoy in it, but you can also find a lot to really yeah. just like. This movie also, if you're interested in it, don't listen to what other people think because you will have a different experience with it than anyone else has. True. It exactly. almost doesn't matter what other people think about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, like literally this entire season, like this was my theory of everything for this season. Like mm-hmm. I was building up to this point being like, I was going to hate revisiting to this. And I kept telling Jason that I was like, I am not looking forward to Moulin Rouge. We're going to get to that pile of shit. And I'm going to be so angry. And Jason was like, Oh man, you're like really building up. Like yeah. this is going to be awful. Like you put a poop emoji <laughs> on the title of the Google talks. You went out of your way to be a hater for this sure one, did. but then you had a good time. So yeah. like, I don't know, maybe I just spent, send your expectations horrifically low. I couldn't have gone lower. <laughs> <laughs> so you went in like ready to kind of feel anything, but yeah, I feel like, yeah, you're right like you could have a totally different experience than i have Mm -hmm. Uh, but on a budget of 50 million dollars it made 179 million dollars worldwide landing it at number 24 for the year so yeah i mean behind everything else going on with like the insane movie itself Mm. it is a musical about love yeah and you can pull an audience with that especially one that is oscar nominated well and we have to remember Ewan McGregor was very hot at this time. Oh, Star Wars is. was coming out very hot. And yeah. Like, because I think Phantom Menace came out in 99. I don't remember if Attack on the Clones, Attack of the Clones was this year or 2002. Uh, I think 2002. But, yeah, I don't know. But anyways. Yeah. Uh, so like he was popular. Nicole Kimmon is obviously always a draw. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you get to put all that together. I think it was a good uh, kind of recipe for success and bringing people in. But it was just, I guess, the matter of if they liked it or not. Yeah. <laughs> all right. What about our scores, though, Jason? I feel like these are going to be kind of separate. It, finally, because we've agreed too much so far. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, what's your enjoyment of Moulin Rouge? <laughs> I give this a 1.5. Jeez. Um, so like this was fresh off my viewing, like my full viewing. And so I do feel like I did find more enjoyment out of it on the rewatch or on like, I guess the full first watch. But a lot of that was in chunks and not as like a cohesive whole. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot that I strongly disliked, which is like sometimes the movie is just like fine throughout and I would rate it like a two, but because I disliked a lot of stuff here, I gave it a 1.5. Yeah, that's uh, I, I see where you're coming from. I'm slapping down a 3.5 for this. I think that the opening 30 minutes are bizarre and hard to digest. (laughs) I do also think some of the writing about love is a little overdone and cringy. Yep. And Nicole Kidman, both her character and her performance wasn't strong enough. But outside of that, the songs, they're strongs. They're mm. so good to watch. <laughs> I love watching so much of this. And it was a, a visual feast. It was an audio feast. <laughs> so I was eating a lot during this movie. So that's 3.5 for me. Mm. Kyle, what's your craft? I'm actually giving this a four. I thought other than like the editing, which is a lot. So much editing. A, every other piece of this was really well put together. Again, I've already said, but costume design, production design, score. And I mean, like I have to commend them for their efforts in interspersing a lot of these songs and the mixes that they made. I didn't necessarily love that it was covers, but I can tell that there was a lot of effort put into making these songs fit in the narrative of the movie. And also when you're combining all of this. So like I do think there's a lot of craft on display. I'm also going to go for I think so much of this is well done. Some of it just a little overdone. Yeah, but that's totally. that. Scott, what's your execution? I guess a two overall story wise. It's fine. And the acting is a little bit over the top. Um, McGregor was fine. He was good. And the Duke was entertaining to watch. Mm-hmm. And actually, uh, the guy who 
the bigger guy, Jim Broadbent. Yeah, Jim Broadbent as Harold Ziddler. He was oh, fun to watch. Fantastic. He was a good guy. Yeah, so, yeah, so two. I'm slapping down this a four. There's a couple pieces of this that could be better, but I think this has a, it has the idea of what it wants to be. And I think it executes that really well. I think yeah. you know exactly what they were going for. And other than some smaller faults to it, I think it executes really well on its vision. Sure. And Kyle, what's your rewatchability? Uh, I give this a negative one. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I'll give it a zero. I'm never going to watch this again. And I also won't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> my huge watchability is 2.5 i would happily watch this again all right but i don't think i want to throw it on on my own unless i have a sick bag near me for the first 30 minutes <laughs> or honestly i might just skip it till the first time yeah. to get to the moulin rouge oh yeah <laughs> all right kyle that is gonna bring your score to a 7.5 out of 20 womp womp for a 38 percent and that is gonna bring my score to a 14 out of 20 for a 70%. Wow. Almost double. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is going to slide us right into ranking zone. Kyle, here's your ranking. Lord of the Rings, Amelie, Donnie Darko, Memento, Royal Tenenbaum, Shrek, Training Day, Ocean's Eleven, Harry Potter, Sexy Beast, The Others, Black Hawk Down, Mulholland Drive, Hedwig, Spy Kids, Monsters Ball, Gosford Park, In the Bedroom, Ghost World. Where is the Moulin Rouge? Well, I thought this was going to be going straight to the bottom, but I looked around the bottom and after, you know, finding a little bit more enjoyment afterwards, I looked at Ghost World. I looked at in the bedroom. I was like, is it better than that? But no, it's not. It's going to the bottom. <laughs> it's, it's my new number 20 under literally everything else. Wow. <laughs> you put an exclamation mark on that yourself. I struggle with this one. I don't know where to put it because it has such a different feeling than so many other movies. Mm. I think what I want to do is slide this in above Ocean's Eleven and below Harry Potter to be my new number 11, meaning that Ocean's Eleven was only number 11 for one week. Wow. <laughs> that is sad stuff. That is going to bring my ranking to Lord of the Rings, Donnie Darko, Amelie, Royal Tenenbaum, Shrek, Training Day, Memento, The Others, Sexy Beast, Harry Potter, Milan Rouge, Ocean's Eleven, Black Hawk Down, In the Bedroom, Mulholland Drive, Hedwig, Spy Kids, Gosford Park, Ghost World, Monsters Ball, we're only one or two slots away from me not being able to do this in one breath. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, did you want to hear what the good people of Letterboxd thought of Moulin Rouge? Absolutely. All right. This has a 3.7 out of 5 on Letterboxd, which is pretty average. Yep. We're starting off with a review by Demi that has no score, but they said, It's insane how relentlessly horny movies were right before 9-11. My man Baz directed this thing like the Tasmanian devil on Cialis. Well, that's accurate. I wonder if there's a real study as to like the level of horniness put into a movie before 9-11 or after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I feel like we need to conduct a very visceral and thorough study mm -hmm. on the horniness of movies in general. That makes me think of this one joke <laughs> comedian had where it's like, if you were born in June of 2002, I have questions for your parents. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, All right. Moving on. Five stars on a rewatch by a sim. It's over, Anakin. I can reach the high notes. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Four and a half by Aaron. Who needs drugs when Baz Luhrmann films exist? Yeah, well, I think Baz Luhrmann does to make them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more. One star by 24 frames of Nick. This is what that fucking Mr. Krabs disoriented meme feels like, and it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Disagree. <laughs> Open your heart to it. You might enjoy the insanity. <laughs> All right, this is the last one. Half star watched by Bruce Wayne's girlfriend and in classic almost bonus episode fashion, Mulan Pooj. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I knew there was probably going to be one in there. Yeah, and I found and it. And if they didn't, you would have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to the Academy Awards. This was nominated eight times. Can you think of any of those eight nominees, Jason? All right, well, I'd put money on Best Picture because I know that one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah ooh, costume? Yes, sir. Set design? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I don't think... The score wasn't as much of the, the movie picture, so I don't think score. Wasn't score. Director? But, nope, no director. Editing? Yes. 
Well, I'll give you the whole list sound here now. Design? Yes, you were, you were right. Yeah, right. Sounds okay. Yeah, uh, so here are the eight nominees. Best sound, best makeup, best art direction slash set direction, best costume design, best editing, best cinematography, best actress Nicole Kidman, oh. and best picture. So Ooh. it won two of those, best art direction and set decoration, and best costume design. Yeah. The wardrobe department created 300 costumes, apparently, Damn. and at one point, 80 people were employed for this task. So wow. a lot of people getting that award. I'm happy with that, though. That was yeah. insane design that went into this. Yeah. It is weird that Nicole Kidman got nominated for this. Did they movie. make a mistake? Yeah. Did they just put her down as an auto because she was a female Maybe. lead? They're like, yeah, it's probably good enough. We don't need to look into that. True. It's like the it's like the Meryl Streep role. Yeah. Like if Meryl Streep's in a movie and she's a lead actress, you just put her in there. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Or maybe they were mistaking this with the others because she was great in the others. Oh, that had to have been it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's the cumulative effort of Moulin Rouge and the others. But then her efforts in Moulin Rouge would have weighed down her efforts in the, the others. So yeah, maybe they're like, well, you know what? She died twice this year. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> Let's get her nomination. All right. Other notable awards. It won the Anthony Asquith Award for Film Music at the BAFTAs. It also won the BAFTA for Best Sound and Best Supporting Actor, Jim Broadbent. Overall, it was nominated for 12 BAFTAs, including Best Film and Best Original Screenplay. It was not nominated for any screenplays at the Oscar. So That is interesting. Yeah. And lastly, I got three Golden Globes that it won. It won Best Performance by an Actress in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical, Nicole Kidman. It also won Best Original Score and Best Motion Picture Comedy or Musical. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, two of those are good i yeah i don't i don't know i don't know if any of those are good i, mean, I also think the best score is like did they think that the songs were the score because the if you were like okay we're willing to allow like a cover that deviates enough from the original to be considered original music yeah and then you also considered original music to be part of the score i could see it mm. but we already have like a double conditional so i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well i actually have a lot of interesting facts like if you like this movie i would actually suggest doing like a good deep dive because there was a lot of actually hmm. interesting facts about Moulin Rouge. And so I, I was surprised that I was having to like pick and choose because I, you know, I thought that nobody would care. About this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, various tricks were used to make John Leguizamo's character's legs appear shorter, which I guess John Leguizamo's character is a real French person. Like, oh. Or based on a real French person? Anyways, uh, some shots are of his stand-in who was at the correct height, while in others he walked on his knees in a special leg brace and wearing blue socks so that his legs could be digitally removed. Leguizamo did the entire climactic scene from a squatting position to give him greater mobility in the role. Consequentially, he had to endure several weeks of physical therapy after the movie. <laughs> oh, my God. He put himself through this. Yeah, really. For a character that didn't have a lot of screen time or that large of a role. <laughs> but good yeah. for him. Continuing on, people getting injured, though. Filming was halted for two weeks in November of 1999 after Nicole Kimmon fractured two ribs and injured her knee while rehearsing a dance routine for the film. Many of the scenes where she is only seen from the chest up, including the uh, real actress scene were shot when she was in a wheelchair <laughs> oh my god yeah i thought you were gonna say like production was halted when nicole kidman actually got consumption <laughs> <laughs> the necklace worn by nicole kidman was made of real diamonds and platinum and was the most expensive piece of jewelry ever specifically made for a film the Stefano Canturi necklace was made of 1,308 diamonds, weighing a total of 134 carats and was worth an estimated 1 million US dollar dues at the time. They're lucky this made so much bank because <laughs> if they were ever needing to look at a budgetary decision that wasn't necessary, <laughs> you could cut a clean 1 million out of this by using like beads. Yeah. Why does it need to be real diamonds? It's not know. in that many scenes. And if it doesn't look sparkly enough with a fake, my God. <laughs> you have cgi <laughs> uh originally the green fairy was going to be played by a long-haired muscle man with a giant sitar and ozzy osborne was hired to provide the vocals eventually it was changed to the current tinkerbell incarnation played by kylie minogue but osborne still gives the voice to the fairy's guttural scream when it turns evil <laughs> 
Hell yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. I, just, I mean, I kind of want to see the, uh, the other version of that. Yeah, That'd be too. funny. <laughs> this movie was launched in Australia to an audience of just 250 people in a small town called Tari, 200 miles north of Sydney. Baz Luhrmann grew up just outside of Tari where his family owned a gas service station. The 250 tickets sold were all sold at a local pharmacy. Oh. Yeah weird yeah so i guess like basler was australian so Mm -hmm. trying to keep it local i guess but sure cool all right so this is my last one heath ledger lost the role when it was determined he was too young to be the romantic interest for nicole kidman he was so angry at Baz Luhrmann that years later he refused to work with him on australia First of all, rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like you could be the romantic interest in Nicole Kidman at like any age. Yeah. But to add to some perspective, in 2000, or I guess this was 1999 when they'd be filming this, Heath Ledger was 20 years old, Nicole Kidman was 32, and Ewan McGregor would be 28. I mean, whatever. Yeah. I don't really care. Did, does Heath Ledger have the pipes for this? I don't know. I would love to hear. I mean, have you seen 10 Reasons Why? Or um, 10 Things I Hate About You? Have you ever seen 10 Things I Hate About You? No. He does a little singing bit in mm, that movie. So he does have some pipes. Yeah. I think I think he could have pulled this off. Interesting. But yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. But anyways, that's all I have for interesting facts. But Jason, any final thoughts on Moulin Rouge? Don't care about the haters. It's fun. That's why it's got an exclamation mark at the end. Yeah. That's, you know it's fun. <laughs> it's a little loud. Kyle, what about you? Uh, I'm done with this movie. Yeah. I'm kind of glad I got through it. Yeah. I didn't want this to go down as the only movie I haven't finished. I couldn't imagine hating this movie. I couldn't imagine having beef with this movie. <laughs> it's just a fun, silly little guy with yeah. some music numbers. I couldn't imagine. But uh, I don't think I'll be seeing Elvis. <laughs> nah, so. Yeah, that's probably for the best. I don't think uh, you need that in your life. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for listening to Season 3, Episode 20 of Snubs and Dubs. As always, you can find us everywhere on social media at Snubs and Dubs. That's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Letterboxd, etc. We're also on Good Pod, so make sure to check us out there and join our official Discord. We'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on on Moulin Rouge or on this episode. So please send us a tweet or a message with a question, recommendation, or anything else. I'm also at Kyle Tobias on Twitter and Jason's at Windy underscore Mills. Of course, all of those links will be in the show notes. Make sure to leave a five-star review, share the show to everyone you know, and check back next week for another episode. Here's a sneak peek of the film we're going to talk about. Sooner or later, everyone needs a haircut. For the kids, there's the Butch or the Heine, the Flat Top, the Ivy, the Junior Contour, and occasionally the Executive Contour me i don't talk much i just cut the hair you say he was being blackmailed by who you don't know for having an affair with who you don't know did anyone else know about it probably not you don't know that's right next time we're talking about the man who wasn't there so make sure to watch it before next episode we're also going to be having our second bonus episode of the season on friday just before we close the book on 2022 i can't wait for you guys to hear those they're gonna be great thanks for listening that's a wrap bye bye for now